too much or too little, the rhetoric following those serious strikes feels well, almost formulaic. With a limited one-off operation and no reported fatalities, all sides seem almost happy to read their lines and stay on script. President Assad now knows the West won't topple him. Uh, the Russians and the Iranians seem to have had plenty of warning to avoid any direct confrontations during that weekend military action. And here in Europe, leaders can say they've acted as uh, familiar arguments play out during parliamentary debates, both in London and here in Paris. We'll be asking about the impact of the strikes and note that there's a coincidence of the calendar. The first working day after uh, the military action happens to be the day the French National Assembly starts considering a bill to tighten asylum laws. So here's a question. What prospects for serious refugees, what with all the major powers left in their comfort zone inside of that country, still more fighting to come, it seems, and no reconciliation in sight? Today in the France 24 debate, is it, as Donald Trump claims, mission accomplished? With us, uh, Member of Parliament Jacques-Marie Lossian, member of Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche party. I always have trouble translating La République En Marche into English. How do you say it? Marching in. Mar marching what? in. Marching in. Okay. <laughs> the rep uh, also, also Good evening. Good evening. Uh, or the journalist Alexis Poulain, co-founder of uh, the publication The Modern World, Le Monde Moderne. Hello. Welcome back. Uh, Syrian activist Yaya Al Abdullah, who uh, is a graduate student at uh, the uh, French uh, School of uh, Social Studies in Higher Learning. W welcome back. And, uh, Thank you very much for having me again. From Arezzo, Italy, always a pleasure to speak with Joshua Landis uh, of the University of Oklahoma and whose blog Syria Comment is a much read. How are you, Joshua? Very good to be with you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24 uh, debate. Yeah, stormy session of uh, the British uh, Parliament earlier. Uh, the uh, uh, Prime Minister, Theresa May, uh, taking part in those strikes uh, without the consent of Parliament, as was the case with Iraq, as was the case with Libya. And of course, as was not the case back in 2013, when it was Parliament that thwarted David Cameron in his bid to take part in uh, punitive action against Bashar al-Assad, Theresa May, who by foregoing the permission of fellow uh, lawmakers, insisted she wasn't following marching orders from Washington. Were we not just following orders from America? Let me be absolutely clear. We have acted because it is in our national interest to do so. It is in our national interest to prevent the further use of chemical weapons in Syria and to uphold and defend the global consensus that these weapons should not be used. For we cannot allow the use of chemical weapons to become normalised, either within Syria, on the streets of the UK or elsewhere. So we have not done this because President Trump asked us to do so. We have done it because we believed it was the right thing to do, and we are not alone. Alexis Poulain, you, your thoughts on that debate in Parliament and the words you just heard? Well, it's strike first and then debate after. Uh, and in both countries, and th three countries actually, uh, US, France and the UK, the question was, can the leaders act and then pretend that they bypass the, the parliamentary uh, mob and, and discuss about the, the use of, of uh, the military weapons in action uh, in this case. Of course, everybody uh, will say, right, we can't use chemical weapons. Uh, this is not fair and this is something of the past and we should destroy all the stocks. It hasn't been done. So let's do it now. It should have been done like the, the, the first deal was meant in 2014 and the Russians have been very slow in, in destroying the, the, the Assad's. And by the way, very slow plans. in letting in those chemical weapons inspectors this uh, Monday. Theresa May accusing the Russians as well as Washington is also accusing them of, of uh, tampering perhaps with the evidence and uh, those weapons inspectors who've not been let in yet by Syrian and Russian inspectors while 
journalists have been let in for a tour organized by the Syrian government. Yeah, but a tour of these facilities, you know, like it's in Iran with the nuclear well, you know, facilities, you, you show what you want people to see. I mean, it's very difficult to have right. a, a precise idea of what it is, especially after the strikes. I mean, if you strike first and then you have uh, the inspector... No, we're talking in. about Duma here. I'm talking about... Yeah. The, uh, oh, for Duma, yes, yeah. of course. But Duma, you, yeah, you had all this and, and the... So the who journalists, just to be clear, site. journalists have been invited into Duma, but not the not chemical the weapons inspectors. <laughs> it's going to be very difficult to, after all these days, to, to, to find more and more trace of, of the, the chemical agents. Uh, but yeah, uh, the big question to me is why three human beings decide uh, a side of the parliament debate uh, to strike uh, a country? And it, it seems okay with international law, with country law. I mean, to me, there's, there's a question here about uh, how we rule ourselves as people. Jacques-Marie Dossian, why act fast? Um, first of all, we must uh, remember that uh, many resolutions at UN have been passed in 2012, 2013, and, and so on, especially on the usage of uh, chemical weapons. And uh, during that period, we also had veto from uh, Russia. So it means Russia has prevented the United nations and the world community to strike back against those uh, chemical weapons. So now we have seen, we have evidence that uh, chemical weapons have been used in Syria. So that's why the uh, three permanent members of the Security Council, uh, UK, US and France, have decided to strike. But the independent monitors ha aren't in yet. They're, they're still in Damascus. Uh, you say there's evidence. Of course, we haven't heard it yet from the independent monitors. What Not have, confirmed evidence. Yeah, what we have been told, we have uh, movies, we have reporters, we have images, we have a lot of evidence that uh, chloride uh, gas was used. Okay, you can see the result of the usage of this chlorine gas. And then we know that we have uh, storage facilities in homes. Uh, manufacturing facilities also, so that's why we, we strike against these uh, three facilities in Syria. Joshua Landis, would you have preferred to see votes in uh, the UK Parliament, here in France, and in the US Congress? Well, this raises a very difficult question. We saw last time with President Obama, who did bring it for a vote, and in London, England voted against the strike. In the United States, they voted against the strike, or they would have voted had Obama uh, not made his deal with the Russians. So the trouble with going through parliament is it takes a long time. You don't know what the local politics are. Often the opposition party wants to, wants to frustrate their president or their prime minister. So it, it gets into a whole other world of politics. And this is why most countries, I believe, have left foreign affairs largely to the executive office in order to make decisions like this. And, uh, you know, of course, in Syria, the president has been doing a lot on his own. Uh, much of the intervention in Syria, it should have been decided in parliament because um, particularly anything that goes beyond destroying ISIS and terrorism. So uh, the uh, build-up to the strikes uh, last week, uh, uh, we, YouGov did a survey of UK voters who were overwhelmingly convinced that, uh, yes, indeed, there was a chemical attack and uh, that Assad or pro-Assad forces even carried it out in Douma. However, and yet, those uh, same uh, voters, less than one in four of them, approving the idea of airstrikes. That's according uh, to a poll uh, for the Times of London, there you see, uh, and, and let me get your reaction to this, Yahya Al Abdullah. Sixty-one percent, an overwhelming majority, when you look at those statistics, yes. who say yes, it was pro-Assad forces who did carry out an attack in Ghouta, but only twenty-two percent were in favor of airstrikes. A as a Syrian living here in France, how do you explain that discrepancy in public opinion? Uh, well. Um Actually, like, uh, it was a little bit of a surprise that, uh, not a uh, surprise, actually, to see England, the, the, the United Kingdom, getting involved uh, in this strike, this time after a huge <coughs> amount, like a very long period of silence, of not saying anything about what is happening in Syria. The chemical attacks uh, have 
Assad used chemical attacks in Syria several times. Uh, it's only just when the, the uh, Russia started interfering in uh, in the internal affairs of. Uh, or with the poisoning of the exactly, script balls. Exactly. That's why uh, yeah. Theresa May just mentioned we will not allow it neither in Syria nor in the British streets or anywhere else. And this is very interesting to compare like uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the lives of, of Syrians to the, to the lives of British uh, citizens <laughs> for the first time, I think, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the conflict. Jacques-Marie Le Sion, uh, no... Uh a Skripal affair with uh, the, that former Russian agent and his daughter uh, found uh, poisoned in the streets of Salisbury. Mm -hmm. No British intervention? Ah, uh, the situation is totally different. When, when you look at what happened in, in, in Syria, we have witness uh, who really saw uh, governmental helicopters dropping bombs. So what's, that's one, one evidence. The second point, if you compare the reaction of the public opinion, uh, never forget that what happened uh, previously in UK when uh, under Mr. Blair, UK joined the coalition against uh, Iraq. Everybody know now, nowadays that uh, we had false evidence provided by the US about these uh, chemical uh, weapons and retaliation arms. So the public opinion in UK is really, let's say, frightened, scared, and reluctant to interventions. In France, it's totally different because we decided not to go to uh, Iraq with the US. So that's why people have a different view of intervention. Let me remind you of the fact that what happened in France is uh, perfectly uh, under the Constitution. Mr. Macron is a head of army in France and is perfectly entitled to send and strike airplanes or frigate for a strike for an intervention. After that, yes, of course, to have a debate in the parliament. So there is no uh, problem constitutionally point of view that the strikes are and correct. It, the Iraq war was brought up in that debate with some parliamentarians uh, hailing the, the days when Jacques Chirac and his foreign mm. ministers at the UN Security Council said no to George, George W. Bush. Yeah, but here we have an intervention, which is a very specific, short, timely intervention. A declaration of war is something totally different. War, as uh, according to our uh, constitution, Article 35, the war must be authorized by the parliament. This is not a war. This is yeah. just an intervention. It's, it's another type of the drone war that is going on for, for years now. It's like uh, you, you, you find a country and it's like, well, I can actually go and bomb a factory, a facility. Let's say now the U.S. decide that Dassault factory in your constituency is, is enough. I mean, I have enough of Dassault, we want Boeing to sell more weapons. Let's try this factory in France. It's not war, it's okay. <laughs> is that okay to some extent? Well, no, of course, it's very different. We talk about Syria. But the question is, Theresa May was saying, we do not obey orders from Washington. Uh, they had to wait yet to have uh, the green light because Bolton now is near to the president and the, the Oaks are back in Washington and they want to be more interventionist in, in the region. Before that, Trump was very mm. against anything to do with Syria or the Russians. And since he got rid of the first circle uh, that people were not faithful to him and now that Bolton and the Oaks are back, then America is back again with the UK, with France, the big guys of the Security Council, the big weapon seller, to go back in the region and, and put on more bombs uh, to the bombs. And I don't question the fact that it was right to strike the chemical weapon facility, but the question of eating a country on demand and saying it's not war is questionable. Uh, I totally uh, agree with, uh, with this point, and I would like to add that the, 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 the uh, attack was very precise. The, the, uh, the targets were very, very specific, and yeah. they were marked before, beforehand, and according to the Syrian state TV and the, the Russian uh, press as well, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the losses are quite limited. So no casualties. The no, casual casualties. No, ca no casualties, but even the destruction in the, in the infrastructure in terms of like what has been destroyed, how much of chemical uh, weapons do we know? That have been destroyed. You're saying it's not the, enough. The, the attack. This attack. You're saying it's I, too I, little. I'm, I'm saying I think it's very difficult to compare this attack in Syria 
with uh, with previous attacks uh, carried out in Libya by uh, yeah. by mm-hmm. the US Spotted and by uh, the yes. UK or mm-hmm. like even to go back to the the Iraq story these are two completely mm-hmm. different things there was an announcement and there was an annu- clear announcement from the United States and clear coalition between uh, France the UK and the United States and most probably these targets were completely evacuated beforehand all right lots of reactions on the hashtag f24 debate this one from Nathan saying no one is saying the chemical attack is right it was a diabolical act but you don't put out a fire with a blowtorch if we want to stop the humanitarian suffering why don't we increase our aid that we send uh, to Syria uh, Alexis Poulain, uh, reflecting a moment ago on uh, whether or not Theresa May uh, was getting her marching orders from Washington. Uh, France's president uh, this Monday uh, walking back slightly the claim that he was the one giving the marching orders to Donald Trump. This is during a Sunday night interview on French television. Il y a dix jours, le president... Ten days ago, President Trump said the U.S. wanted to leave Syria, and we convinced him. We convinced him that it was necessary to stay. Joshua Landis, uh, how much do you think uh, Emmanuel Macron is responsible for Donald Trump's actions here? Well, there are a lot of people trying to get America to stay in Syria, and this is, you know, this raises the much bigger question of what, what is the plan for Syria, what is the Western policy toward Syria? And we saw that under Tillerson, uh, the Secretary of State that was just fired in the United States, the idea was to stay in Syria for the long haul, as he called it, in order to uh, really <clears throat> to put the screws on Assad, the Iranians, and Russians, keep most of the resources which America dominates in the north of Syria. America controls about. 30% of Syrian territory today with its Kurdish and uh, Syrian democratic forces allies in the north of Syria. Most of the oil, lots of water, best agricultural land. And the idea was to keep that from going to Assad so that the Russians would then be, it would turn Syria into a quagmire for the Russians and the Iranians. This policy, and uh, I think is is a very, it's a, it's a mean policy. I understand it. You don't want Russia and Iran to win. You want to help your allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, who don't want Iranian influence in Syria. But it will only starve the Syrian people. There was no plan for overturning Assad or developing a better Syria. And, and this gets to your callers, really, his underlying question, which is, where is this policy leading us? And, and right now, the greater struggle between America and Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, is only destroying Syria and impoverishing Syria. And there isn't yet a vision for how to move forward in a better way. And can you move forward uh, while Bashar al-Assad is president of Syria? Who is that question addressed to? To to you, Joshua. (laughs) Okay. Um, You know, the Syria, many Syrians can move forward. You know, for America, I don't know if America can move forward in Syria. America can turn its back on Syria. But America has a very important decision to make. Does it want to remain in northern Syria, closing off all the highways? Today, America owns the major highway to Baghdad, at Tunf, it stopped it. In the major highway to Amman, most of the trade routes are closed. America has severe sanctions on. It is demanded that no international organization, the UNDP, the UN, World Bank, IMF, do any business to help reconstruct Syria. So there is a total embargo on Syria without a plan to overthrow Assad. That will only lead to further starvation. It will lead to, I think, the worsening for terrorism. It will mean that refugees do not go home. And it does not have a plan for overthrowing Assad or making Syria better. And that, in many ways, I think it would be better to turn your back to Syria, allow Russia and Iran to win, and allow them to try to rebuild Syria, at least connect highways to Iraq 
and Iran and Lebanon <laughs> in order to. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're going to pick up on this point because unfortunately yeah. we have to take a very quick break. Lots of reactions from our panel on set. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. <laughs> Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate after uh, those uh, airstrikes that took place in Syria over the weekend. What next for that uh, country? Uh, we're talking about it uh, with a uh, member of the French parliament, Jacques Marie Lossian, uh, who is with uh, the majority La République En Marche party of Emmanuel Macron, journalist uh, Alexis Poulin, co-founder of The Modern World, Le Monde Moderne. Uh, Syrian activist Yahya Al-Abdullah is at uh, the uh, French uh, School of Higher Learning uh, uh, Graduate uh, School, EHESS, and from Arezzo, Italy, uh, Joshua Landis of the University of Oklahoma and uh, whose Syria comment blog is a, is a much read. Joshua, just before the break, telling uh, us uh, there has to be a long-term plan. Maybe one of those long-term plans is to open up Syria and let uh, the Iranians and the Russians uh, help to fix it. I'm paraphrasing <laughs> a little bit, jo Joshua, what you said. Uh, we're, sh we're looking at a map now uh, of uh, who controls what currently, and the part where that's under U.S. control that Joshua was mentioning there uh, is in uh, blue. Uh, Yahya Abdullah, what, what do you think of, of Joshua's yeah, I want proposal? To, I want to pick up on what uh, Mr. Landis uh, just suggested. Like uh, He suggested, I, I heard two, two completely... Uh, contradictory statements like the first one is like let's get rid of Assad which is I think is the beginning the ver very first step he said there are two options and then yeah. getting rid of Assad is one of them Th that is the, that is the option that would put us on the first uh, like give us the that put us on the track to go towards solving all the problems that we are facing in Syria now. Then the second uh, option which is leaving the Russians and the Amer like let America turn its back uh, admit its defeat and let the Russians and the, and the Iranians uh, fix the problem. I think this is um, quite um, um, impossible to, to realize if you are talking about finishing the conflict. This is just prolonging the conflict. This option for me is just putting us on a track where we are going to dream about ending the conflict in Syria not going into any realistic... Okay, uh, but let, let's decision. look at what happens next right now, right. concretely on the ground. You've got the rebels who've been pushed into Idlib province, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can call up that map again, maybe we can, we can show. Uh, and and uh, <coughs> it, it, that could mean refugees, radical militants who may be pushed this time, uh, Idlib, the part in yellow there towards the top uh, left-hand corner of your screen, mm -hmm. um, who could be pushed across the Turkish border. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what happens at that point, uh, Jacques-Marie Lossian? Does it mean that uh, Turkey is going to be once again feeling the pressure of a new refugee crisis, new militants crossing their border and perhaps going to Europe? What, how does the West, does the West stand idle? with the next phase of the Syrian civil war? Uh, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Le Drian, has explained that la last week that we are probably in front of a uh, humanitarian crisis ahead of us. If we let the uh, Syrian regime attack again uh, the people that are in Idlib region, uh, the point is we must continue to uh, keep negotiating with the Syrian regime. And the only solution, as you said, is an outcome uh, with the resumption of negotiation and probably to find a way to get As uh, Bashar al-Assad out of Syria with his consent and also with the consent of the Russians and the, and the Iranians. Nobody would understand that, as the US, Mr. Landy said, the US just has to turn its back, that the international community just let those people uh, take control of Syria without negotiating a truce, without negotiating the end of the conflict, and without negotiating how to um, fix the humanitarian problems. But you know, public opinion in Britain, we talked about that in part one, public opinion in France, similar story. There's not much of a stomach for really upping the pressure to force out Assad, is there? The challenge is that we, we were, uh, in the past, um, in 2013, 
when uh, President Hollande wanted to strike uh, Assad's regime. Unfortunately, Mr. Obama uh, didn't took the opportunity to, to strike, and probably we have lost uh, a lot of time and a lot of casualties because of that. Mm -hmm. Joshua Landis, what happens next? Is it going to be this battle for Idlib that's going to have repercussions beyond Syria's border? Uh, Turkey already has about eight observation posts that it's set up uh, with military men in them around Idlib. It, it looks like Turkey has already made a, a real move for Idlib, will defend it, and has made agreements with most of the rebel groups, precisely because it does not want Assad to drive these people, all the rebel groups, of which, of their, which there are tens of thousands there, um, into Turkey. So it looks like Turkey is going to add Idlib province, or at least a good hunk of it, into the areas that Turkey has already taken, like Afrin, where it's driven out the Kurds, and Jarablos in the north, where it's working with Syrian rebel groups. So Syria is being divided into three major sectors as we speak. One dominated by Assad, which he controls largely and, and has defeated many of the rebels, as he just did with Duma. Another by the United States, about 30 percent, which is in the northeast, but also an important element around Tunf, the major Baghdad. And then another area by the Turks in the north and the northwest. And this looks more or less the way things are going to stay, unless Trump gets his way and, and, and withdraws American troops from that 30 percent, in which case there'll be a scramble for control of northern Syria and between Turkey, Assad and various rebel groups. So that brings so, us to the other claim that we heard Sunday night from Emmanuel and, Macron, which was, Joshua, that uh, uh, France had uh, succeeded, he claimed, in driving a wedge between Turkey and Russia. Mm hmm. Probably. I don't think so. You know, France, <laughs> France, <laughs> France wasn't. Uh, America wasn't going to overthrow Assad in 2013 because the two major rebel powers were ISIS, which owned about one fourth or even more than that of Syria, and Al Qaeda, which was a dominant power on the other side. <laughs> had Assad owned in 2013. Those major rebel forces would have taken Damascus, which is precisely why Obama and others retreated in horror from this concept. They didn't like Assad. They didn't want to help them. But they didn't want ISIS and other radicals to take over either, which is why America switched its focus from defeating Assad to destroying ISIS. And the chance of Assad being overthrown by any pressure or diplomatic pressure from France or from Britain or from the United States today seems to me close to zero. We just saw this spectacular show of force, which had nothing to do with changing the course of the Syrian civil war. And each leader. No, but the claim by the claim Macron, by the claim by Macron is that he's driven a wedge between Turkey and Russia. And just just to say just to say that. something actually here just to say something in 2013 around 60 percent of the Syrian land was controlled by the rebels and ISIS was just given Smoking. power when the Iraqi army along with the Americans left Mosul for ISIS 2013 ISIS just entered Syria. Yeah, there is like, there, yeah there is one. we've heard the Turkish okay. foreign minister by the way on a trip to. Uh, to NATO headquarters this Monday, staunchly deny that uh, in any way there's any uh, problem between Ankara and Moscow right now. Uh, these are diplomatic uh, statements, but we just uh, started to mention for the first time in this debate ISIS. Okay, we must not we must not forget that ISIS is a binding factor in all this story. We just discussed about Syria. But we must remi remind of, uh, ourselves that uh, UK, France, uh, and the United States are also there to fight against ISIS. Mm -hmm. So we, you have a sort of overlap between the Syrian internal civil war and the fight mm -hmm. against ISIS. That's why it is so complicated to understand. And, and, you, have, and you have the Kurds. Uh, who are really left to their own, really, with this move now of France and the NATO allies to say, OK, we need you, Turkey, we need you big time, so do whatever you want with the Kurds. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for them now. Uh, and, and, of course, the big question, and 
it, it was very naive uh, from a French leader or a UK leader to think that they have a position to influence America because it's make America great again and it's America first. <laughs> and they don't have privilege, a lie or whatever. They just have a lie in the right moment for the right strike. And they say, OK, you want to show your weapon? Go ahead. Uh, we'll help you with that. But th the answer to this is really what is the plan of America in the region? the long-term plan. And if there is one plan in the region, say, we don't want Iran to be the big boss of the region, whatever. And Iran was really big in this conflict and getting really big. And I think this first strike and, and the fact that they still have troops in Syria, Syria is nothing. But hang on, but if you're saying that the, that the United States' number one priority at this point is to, is to rein in Iran's influence, surely that'd be an argument for supporting the Kurds who uh, are the ones in the way, if you will. Not because I mean, you have to use Turkey as well. Exactly. It's a big ally for NATO. So you can't just go yeah. with the Kurds because Turkey is key to first, you know, manage yeah. Syria and then we'll see what happened next. But the end of war, as you said, is very difficult. And peace is the most difficult thing in the world. War is easy. You just throw in more people, throw in more bombs. But what is the plan? When do the both party will talk the truth and say, OK, we stop fighting. Uh, let's strike a deal. Nobody wants to do that right now. Uh, nobody wants to have a, a truth or yeah. peace, especially not Assad. And I don't think Assad will want to leave that easily, even if he's asked to or even if he think of it and pushed by Putin. It's not the case right now. now th th that's why, for instance, President Macron is visiting U.S. Uh, next week. He yeah. will be meeting uh, with President uh, Trump. And a few weeks later, he will go be to in, in Moscow. Yeah. So we, the, the position of France is, is consistent. We are working to establish peace, but we have to discuss with everybody. That, that's why uh, President Macron recognized the role of Russia last year. Uh, we have probably neglected Russia too long in this process. And that's why he received uh, President Putin in, in Versailles uh, to show him respect, but uh, also to be uh, heard by uh, President Putin, because if you are not respected, you are not listened and you are not understood and you are not heard. Uh, Joshua Landis, uh, y your thoughts, because uh, when he travels to Washington next week, Emmanuel Macron's <coughs> top mission will be to try to convince uh, Donald Trump not to walk away from the Iran nuclear deal. When it comes to Syria, what, what should he be saying to the U.S. president? <laughs> Well, this is precisely where I think a, a lot of the newfound unity that we saw in this missile strike, which was admittedly very limited and didn't really change much in Syria, is really about the Iran deal. Because I think they're both, both Macron and, and, uh, and, and Britain are worried that Obama, that, excuse me, Trump is going to walk <laughs> away from you. They don't want that. They want Trump to... I think compromise with them and they went along with Trump on this missile strike. And in a sense, I think they're trying to regain some leverage because they're worried that America is going to walk away from this and, um, and, and leave a shambles behind and that they don't want to cut relations with Iran. They don't want to see Iran unleashed and move towards a nuclear weapon, which could lead to greater war in the Middle East and more destruction. So the situation needs real delicate diplomacy at this point. And uh, in that sense, you know, America walking out of uh, northern Syria, I, I don't know whether that's their greatest concern. Certainly they don't want the pressure taken off Assad. But what their plan is, nobody has a plan. Nobody is talking about getting Assad. How do you explain the, it? How do you explain it? Because you had the White House spokesperson again this Monday saying that uh, the plan is to leave uh, Syria soon. Uh, again, that part of Syria that they control uh, is, uh, a, you might say, if you look at a map, a buffer between Iran uh, and, uh, the, and, and, and the Israeli border. But it's a, it's a minefield for America. It is a terrible policy for the United States to remain there to try to promote Kurdish nationalism in Syria and build a nation state in northern Syria where there are only two and a half million Kurds mm -hmm. is the poorest part of Syria. It's completely destroyed. America would have to spend billions of dollars. The American people will not put up with that. There have been strikes from one end of America to the other because our teachers have not gotten raises for 10 years. 
they're not going to spend another trillion dollars in a nation building adventure in northern Syria, the most the most conflicted region of Syria, where Kurds and Arabs are at each other's throats, very poor. This would be insane for America to try to get into some major, you know, nation building project there and to remain there for the next 30 years. Uh, so I think Trump is correct in his instinct. The problem is what do you do about Syria? And, and that's nobody has an answer for. Seven years on, nearly half of the population remains displaced, either internally or, or abroad. Yahya al-Abdullah, um, will you go back to Syria if Bashar al-Assad is president and there's a final resolution of the conflict? If he is a president, yeah. I would never return, of course, I, because I don't trust the Syrian regime and I don't trust the... Uh, Assad, the hundred percent no. The answer is no. Why? Why even if there is, you know, a reconciliation, a peace, the peace agreements that uh, yes, me Alexei being, was me talking being, about. Why? Why would? You, why are you so here. certain you wouldn't return? Me being here because I experienced it for twenty six years. My first encounter with this oppressing regime, with this dictatorship, was when I was six years old, mm -hmm. when I had to leave the school in a small village and go out and chant forever for the immortal leader of, of Syria when I was six years old on a very small village, not even on any map, mm. under the rain. Bashar's father. Of course, that was at the time of Bashar's father. But what, what is the difference between the father mm -hmm. and the son? The son turned to be ten times worse than the, mm. the father, at least. Anyway, but like I am really surprised with the, with the cynical... A black and white uh, image Mr. Landis is keep uh, telling us. Like, so it's, America has no interest there. America has to take care of its own problems. And uh, the best solution is just to leave Syria as it is. Turn, let America turn its back and uh, let Assad continue. This is, this is, this is unacceptable. This is I, I think unbelievably the unacceptable. Yeah. Jo Joshua Landis, very, very briefly. Isn't it more to, to keep on squeezing the Syrian people without a plan to get rid of Assad, because that's what America's plan is today. It has no plan to but get rid of Assad. I, then, I believe, then I believe what we really need now is to sit down and, and have a plan. Like for me, like one of the most annoying things about the chemical attacks, just let me get back to this very briefly, is that uh, the states, France and the UK, decided to make it kind of official that Assad will be punished only when he uses chemical attacks. There, there is one point I would like to add. Uh, what Mr. Landis should understand, that especially in Europe, I've been in, in the UK recently, but also in, in Germany, uh, most of the uh, public opinion is absolutely convinced that um, the, the only one that is responsible for all these problems, all this conflict in Middle East, is America, because of the Iraqi war. Okay, yes. Conducting the Iraqi war, without uh, lies, and with what did, lies. And what did, that what did that entail? It entailed regime change. And so regime change from abroad, and it didn't work well. And it's same, you could be said for Libya as yeah, well. Yeah, and, and all, all, the, all what happened in Iraq uh, with the uh, loss of uh, Saddam Hussein, which is not, I will not uh, complain about that, but the destruction of uh, stability in the whole Middle East is a responsibility so it's not of the, the United job States. To overthrow Assad, yeah, it? and that, that's why the public opinion are uh, considering that US are, USA is responsible for uh, what happened in the region. So leaving the region after having created a complete mess in the region is something that the public no, the, opinion will not accept in, in, in Middle East back, and in Europe. Middle East, Middle East is a creation of, of the West. It's, we are the fathers of, of this mess. And we don't want to, to, to be up to our acts. And that's why Blair went to war in Iraq. He wanted to put things right. Well, fail. But it, it, the old countries, the way it's been done, France, UK, and then the US, they all came in for the gas, they all came in for the oil, and they made these countries. And now there's a war still Not for the recently. same reason. Not recently. Not recently. I'm talking back in the 40s, 50s, okay. and when Israel was created. And, and, and no, it's too late. And no, what, what you do is like you can't you know, use the UN. UN is not used to the full level that it should be. Uh, so far, it's just uh, a deal at the Security Council, but there's no troops of the UN. We don't want to do that anymore. It's too expensive. So it's just like, okay, let's use the big bombs and we'll see what happens. Joshua Landis, it's been seven years so far.
It's true. And I, I think what your caller, what your, uh, excuse me, what we just heard about America messing up the region is all the more reason why America should try to withdraw. Because <laughs> to think that America is going to fix the region today after, you know, 20 years of intervening in Iraq and, and Libya and so forth, I just don't believe that America has the tools and the know-how to fix it. And I don't know, I haven't heard anybody say what America should do in this group that's going to be positive. You, we've, we've heard a long litany of all the mistakes that America made and why it's, it, it has bad leadership and other things. But why not? What, what is your plan for what America should do? Uh, certainly, you know, is it to, to bomb Damascus, get rid of Assad, and then <coughs> occupy the country with the UN force. I don't. I just don't know no, what it is. No. All right. We're, unfortunately, we're not going to know this time because the clock has caught up with us. Again. Joshua Landis, <laughs> I want to thank you, though, for joining us uh, from uh, Arezzo, Italy. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Jacques-Marie Lucien, uh, Yaya Al-Abdullah, Alexis Poulin. Stay with us, please. Media Watch is next.